In chapter 5.1, we're going to pick up with the concept of national income accounting. So what do we mean by national income accounting and why should we care about it? Accounting doesn't sound like a very fun thing, but it turns out to be very, very useful. So let's take a look at our first um, statement here. In order to formulate a policy to fix a problem, in other words, for a government to fix a problem, the decision makers need to identify the extent of the problem. So whenever the problem can be measured in economic terms, we need to figure out how much um, economic resources are we dealing with. So national income accounting was created to provide answers to the following kinds of questions. For instance, how much output is being produced? What's it being used for? How much income is being generated in the marketplace? What's happening to prices and wages? All of these are very, very interesting questions and very useful when you're trying to get a society to be more functional. So it turns out that we're now going to measure the output. So each good and service that's produced and brought to market has a price, which serves as its measure of value. Now that's the statement. Is that legitimate? Well, remember from the previous work we did on supply and demand, where does the price come from? The price is the interaction of what consumers value and what it costs producers to produce the good. So when you reach the equilibrium point, you found the balance point in the, in the price, the price of the market is the balance point between supply and demand. So economists use that as our best figure for trying to come up with how much is something worth. Well, it's worth its market price because that's what people are willing to pay for. So, as long as you agree that willingness to pay is a good way to measure the value of something, then you're now able to use the mecha mechanism that we're going to talk about. That mechanism is called gross domestic product, usually abbreviated as GDP. And what is it? The gross domestic product is the total dollar value of all final goods and services produced within a nation's borders in a given time period, usually a year. So, we are going to take all the goods and services produced add them up by their total dollar values, and then say that's what your economy produced this year. Now, there's some complications in measuring the GDP. Now, the first one we're going to talk about is we need to make sure we're excluding what are called intermediate goods. Let's define that. So an intermediate good is a good or a service purchased for use as an input in the production of final goods or in final services. Let me give you an example. Let's assume there's one company that produces water pumps for engines, sells those water pumps to an engine maker. The engine maker sells the engine to a truck manufacturer. The truck manufacturer sells it to a final customer. Now, here's the interesting problem. If the water pump costs $300 to produce, it's sold to an engine maker, and the engine maker sells the engine for $7,000, and then the final truck that the engine's put into is sold for $50,000, is it correct to add up all those different numbers together and say, we produce $57,300 worth of stuff? Well, it turns out the answer is no. You want to make sure you don't count the intermediate goods because I presume you all recognize this. If the engine seller has to buy a water pump from a different manufacturer, when they sell the engine, they're including the price of the water pump in the price of the engine. They're not giving the water pump for free. So if they sell the engine for $7,000, the reality is they only did $6,700 of the work themselves and they paid someone else $300 to sell them the, the water pump. And that's how they came up with the $7,000 number. And the same thing's true with the truck manufacturer. The truck manufacturer didn't do the entire $50,000 worth of work to build that truck they paid $7,000 to the engine maker. So they really only did about $43,000 worth of work and then $7,000 for the engine came up with the price of $50,000. So it turns out that the final good, when it's sold to the final customer, already includes all of the intermediate stages of production. So the whole reason we're bringing this up is you can wildly overcount and overestimate the GDP of a country if you counted up the register receipt of every single company, because many companies are selling intermediate goods to another company, and then that company will do something with it and sell it further down the line to someone else. So you only want to count the final goods and services. And we define final goods and services as the good or service that's going to go to its ultimate consumer. Okay.
So as long as a business is buying it to use it in their production process, it's an intermediate good. When it's sold to the final consumer who's going to enjoy it for its own sake, then it's a final good. Now, another way of doing this, you can just do what I just said, add up only the final goods, and that will capture all the intermediate goods. Or you could do what's called add up the value added. Now, you notice the value added would be, for in my example, we would take $300 from the water pump manufacturer. That's how much they're going to contribute to the final truck. And then instead of $7,000 for the engine maker, we add up only $6,700 for the engine maker because that's the work they did. And then instead of adding up $50,000, which is the final sales price of the truck, we only add up $43,000 is the value added created by the truck manufacturer and then add up the value added. So then you would add what? 300 to 6,700, come up with 7,000, add 7,000 to 43,000, you're up to 50. So either way, whether you add up the final good itself or add up the value added, not the, you know, not the sales price, but the value added in addition to what stuff you bought, then you would end up with the exact same number. So there's two different ways to do it. It's usually easiest to go ahead and just go to the final goods and services and add them up. So now we recognize that's how we're going to capture the value of all the final goods and services produced is adding them up by their market value. Let's take a look at one more issue of why we use market prices as our mechanism for adding up total production. Because here, this slide raises a really interesting question. Why don't we just simply add up the physical items that are produced? Why add the dollar amounts of the items? Well, let's actually try it. Here's a made up example where a country produces oranges, bicycles, and rock concerts, and they produce 3 billion of the oranges, 3 million bicycles, and 700, 000, 700 rock concerts. How do you add those up if you don't do dollars? Are you able to add apples and oranges? I mean, that's a famous phrase that you can't do that. And that's because addition doesn't work on things that are of different essences. And there's no way you can add up a rock concert with a bicycle. It doesn't make any sense. But you can add them up if you do it in dollars because the dollars represent what people desire. And let's do that. Let's go ahead now and turn these three billion oranges, and as you can see in the, in the slide, they're 40 cents each, so we produce what? Uh, 1 billion, 200 million dollars worth of oranges. The two million bicycles sell for $100 each, so we produce 200 million dollars worth of bicycles. And then 700 rock concerts cost a million dollars to put on each. So we put out 700 million dollars worth of um, rock concerts. What's the total value to our society of all these concerts, or rather of all these items? Well, now we can see we can add them up because you can add dollars together. You just can't add the different items together. So it turns out our particular economy produces $2 billion, $100 million worth of goods and services. Now, how about the next year? So the next year, oranges, um, orange production jumps to $4 billion. Bicycle production jumps to $4 million. Rock concerts fall to six hundred. dollars So... Now, what's the total value? Again, you can't add up the physical items. You can't tell, are we getting ahead? Are we falling behind? It's very difficult to know. Whereas if you convert it all into dollars, you find out that what? you have what $1,600,000,000 worth of, of oranges, $400,000,000 worth of uh, bicycles, $600,000,000 worth of concerts added together. And it turns out now we have $2,600,000,000. So an increase of $500,000,000 from the previous year. So you can see what converting everything to dollars at market prices does for us. It now permits us to add up, quote unquote, apples and oranges, because now we've converted the apples and oranges into dollars, and then all the dollars themselves can now be added together. Next issue, let's take a look at something called international comparisons. The first thing we need to recognize is that GDP is geographically focused, which means we calculate the GDP for each nation's output based on what is produced on their territory. So we have the GDP of the United States based on America's production. We have the GDP of Mexico based on Mexico's production. We have the GDP of Canada based on Canada's production. And then of course we do that for every single country in the world. And then we add up that way we can compare all the different GDPs of different countries. So this makes it easy to make international comparisons of economic activity by adding up all the market prices of all those goods and services from the different countries. 
And then further, we make another comparison called GDP per capita, where you take the total dollar of GDP and divide it by the population. And then that gives you a number that tells you what would be the average income for all the people in that country. Now remember, that's strictly a mathematical average. It doesn't tell you what any specific person earns, because we also know from previous chapters that income is distributed unequally in every country. Rich people obviously make more money than poor people. So when you do GDP per capita, what you're getting is the average of what the incomes are in that country, not what the rich make, not what the poor make, but what the average is. So we've defined on the previous slide what GDP per capita is. So let's remind ourselves GDP per capita is GDP divided by population. So it's the average output per person for the country. And we have, it makes a good proxy for what's the country's standard of living. Because once you know what the average person is doing in the country as far as how much total income goes to that person on average, then you have a general idea of where the country stands in its total standard of living. Now remember, in our next bullet point, it points out that we don't know how unequal the incomes are distributed. Um, some countries may be skewed dramatically more toward the rich. So if you looked at the average, it would overstate where the, average, you know, where the normal average person is because obviously if you average in a large number of very rich people, it will skew the average higher. Just like if with grades, if you took 10 people who had perfect hundreds and added them to the class, we would say, oh, the class average is much higher. But of course, the rest of the students aren't doing any better. So my point is you have to be careful how you use averages. And then we also know that if a country has very low GDP per capita, there's a very good chance there's going to be a lot of extreme poverty in that country. Because if that is the average, remember, because GDP per capita gives you the average, there are people who are below average. So if the average itself is very low, then you would recognize that the you know, poor people in that country could be in some very, very serious economic hardship. So that's why we use GDP and GDP per capita in order to make countries comparable. Now let's go back to the issue of inequality. And here in this slide, we're talking about global inequalities. So we know, and again, I'm just gonna read the slide, then we'll make sense of it. The statistical comparisons of GDP across nations are abstract and lifeless, meaning they're just looking at data, right? It's very hard to get fired up about numbers, at least for most people. They do, however, convey real differences in the way people live. So remember, disparities in per capita GDP mean that people in low income countries are, number, the next bullet point, they have low GDP per capita, which is the statistical statement. But what does that mean in real life? It means they have very little access to phones, very little access to televisions, very few paved roads, very few schools. They may not have safe water because they don't have the water infrastructure. Because how do you get all those things? Well, you have the output and the income necessary to pay for all those things. So if you live in a country for which the GDP per capita is very low, then by definition, the income of that country is very low, and therefore people can't afford to pay for clean water and good roads and all those other kinds of things. So always remember, when we start making GDP comparisons, a lot of people's eyes glaze over and say, well, it's just all accounting hum, you know, mumbo jumbo. But the reality is it gives a good statistical overview of what that means for people's true um, standard of living. And then last but not least, certainly not least, People die a lot younger in, um, in poor countries. So that's another major problem for when you look at GDP per capita and it's low, that's also telling you something about life expectancy. The richer the country, the longer people live, the poorer the country, the sooner they die. And that's of course because not only do you not have school, you know, have good access to schools when you're poor, you also don't have good access to medical care when you're poor. So poorer countries generally across the board have less of the desirable things of life than do rich countries. One last measurement problem. Remember, here we're talking about measuring GDP. GDP measures exclude most goods and services produced but not sold in a market. These are referred to as non-market activities. So unpaid or non-market production done at home or by volunteer workers 
doesn't get counted in the GDP statistics. So if you live in a country that's, uh, let's say, a relatively poor country where a large number of people are farmers on their own land growing their own vegetables for themselves and they aren't selling them, is the government counting all that production? Well, of course not. If it didn't get to a market, given the mechanism we're using here, then obviously it's not going to get counted. So that's the part I want you all to recognize. So countries that have large amounts of home work don't get counted. Anything done off the books or in the underground economy, the underground economy, um, I should have put it in quote marks, but most people know what we mean. The underground economy is either something done illegally or for tax evasion purposes. So for instance, uh, I'll give you a personal example. A few years ago, we had an electrician come to our house to install a 220 volt power line because we were getting an, another oven that was higher voltage than our previous oven. So the new installation of the oven required a new 220 volt outlet. So we hired an electrician. When I went to pay him, I pulled out my checkbook and he says, no, 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 I want cash. Why do you think he did that? Most likely it's because he's not reporting it, right? So if he's not reporting it, is the government collecting the statistics showing how much work that electrician is doing? Well, of course not. So we recognize that if you have a large underground economy, your government statistics on GDP are going to be undercounting the, the reality. So the official GDP measurements may significantly understate actual production in countries that have either large amounts of unpaid or non-market work or have large underground economies.